Now in the last video we talked about isotopes which are basically different versions of the same element and some of these versions were going to be unstable and be likely to actually decay over long periods of time either because they're too large and the strong force is not going to be strong enough to actually hold them together or because they are going to have extra number of neutrons which will be more likely to interact with the weak force leading to radioactive decay. Let's talk about that and understand why some isotopes are unstable. Now there's two main kinds of decay. The first kind of decay is what we call small decay. Now small decay is only going to happen when an atom has extra neutrons or too many neutrons for the number of protons that it has. You're going to need basically one neutron per proton in many cases to actually separate the protons successively within the atom and create enough buffer so that the positive charges do not repel themselves and then the strong force can be possibly strong enough to actually hold the nucleus of the atom together. But if you have too many charges um, on the same place, you might need some extra neutrons to hold it there. But when you have way too many neutrons for the number that you actually need, you're going to end up getting decay. Now there's basically two major kinds of decay. One is going to be the small and one is going to be the large. Now radioactivity has nothing to do with what you think about in terms of the sun's radiation or although the sun does do things like this inside of it but I'm not talking about like radio waves, microwaves, infrared, visible light, um, inf ultraviolet, x-rays and gamma rays. In other words I'm not talking about electromagnetic radiation per se even though radioactive decay sometimes does release uh, radiation of those kinds. But I'm talking about radioactivity of the kind that you'll hear about in nuclear power plants or nuclear bombs or radioactive isotopes or carbon dating or things like that. Radioactive elements or unstable elements that tend to decay over time because they can't hold their integrity. Now there's two reasons why that would happen. One, they're too big so that the strong force can no longer hold the nucleus. Or two, the quarks inside the actual protons and neutrons accidentally interact with the weak force, they absorb uh, the weak force bosons and they will then be changed into a different kind of quark which then changes whether that's a proton or neutron which then destabilizes the nucleus and causes it to decay. But whichever reason the atom is decaying it usually happens because there's too many things in this atom. Either the atom is too big or it has too many neutrons. Now if it's decaying because it has too many neutrons it's, actually, it's just going to do one or two things. It's going to be particle decay or energy decay. Now in energy decay you're going to produce electromagnetic radiation in the form of a photon which actually carries electricity or an electrical magnetic intensity. And usually this is going to be very very intense radiation in the form of gamma rays and if you were blasted by something like this it actually would cause cell tissue damage and scarring and it might actually burn your head which is why when you touch something that's really 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 radioactive you're going to feel it's hot and that's actually how we use it to create nuclear power we'll talk about that in the next video but there's also particle radiation particle radiation are small little chunks that are coming out of the nucleus as is the case and these chunks will be high velocity chunks stringing out of the nucleus I think of them as tiny tiny atomic bullets shooting up from the nucleus of radioactive atoms and it, again that's another reason why you get hurt if you get contaminated by something radioactive because this material is going to be shooting up bullets which are going to be shooting holes through all your molecules and cells all throughout your body and then it's going to be causing more mutations and more problems and eventually death by radiation poisoning and so either because you're blasted or cooked by the gamma radiation or basically a bunch of tiny microscopic bullet holes get punched into you when you get exposed to radiation but there's also some good uses for radiation and we're going to talk about that them in the next video but for now I wanted to explain the two main kinds of radiation so in terms of particle radiation you can get either proton decay or electron decay or nuclear at decay now alpha decay is the, when you actually lose an entire helium-4 nucleus so this is going to happen in larger atoms and basically the atom itself is going to shoot out as it becomes unstable a whole nucleus that looks like the nucleus of a helium-4. It will have two protons and two neutrons kind of coming out of the nucleus and that's what we call the alpha decay and it will happen as the, as the al al atom is trying to shoot out or restabilize or become smaller to actually be able to hold together and you also have beta decay. Now beta decay 
it happens when the atom basically loses an electron. And there's actually two types of, of that kind of decay. Uh, there's beta minus decay, and that's what will happen when, say, say for example, carbon-14, which has two extra neutrons, because it has only six protons, it doesn't need those six, two extra neutrons, and therefore it has an atomic mass number of 14, uh, which is six plus four, and that's the number that you see there, that's why we call it carbon-14. Now this is going to be unstable, and it's going to undergo beta minus decay, and it's going to lose particles. And in the process, it's actually going to, one of the neutrons is going to become a proton, and an anti-neutrino and an electron will be released as part of the process. Actually, what's happening here is that quarks are going to become energy, which then is going to become these particles, anti-neutrinos and electrons. Now, notice you're making matter and antimatter out of this decay. And this antineutrino will collide with a neutrino and immediately annihilate itself and probably become energy in the form of gamma radiation. But you're also going to get an electron flying out of the nucleus. So sometimes in radioactive decay, a uh, high energy electron will just basically shoot out of the nucleus of this atom. Now, in the case of nitrogen, as 14, that's we have seven protons and seven neutrons, so that's stable, and it will actually stay like that for a very, very long time. Now Look at carbon-10, for example. Carbon-10 is a very, very strange radioactive element where you don't have enough neutrons, so you have the opposite. You're missing neutrons to stabilize this atom, so the way it happens is like the opposite of beta-minus. It's, kind of, it's called beta-plus, in which you actually, again, go down a, um, a proton number instead of going up a proton number. All right, so and instead of getting out an electron, you get the opposite, which is the antimatter version of the electron. You get a positron, and instead of getting an antineutrino, you get the opposite of that, which is a neutrino. So it's exactly the opposite matter antimatter that you would get into in the beta minus decay that actually happens. And just in like the beta minus made the neutrons go down, but made protons go up because one of the neutrons became a proton and the rest of the energy got released as an electron and an antineutrino. Here's the opposite. Uh, one of the protons becomes a neutron and then the opposite kind of conformation of particles gets released. And that has to do with which quark is actually interacting with the weak force to make all of this happen. Because this is all mediated by the weak force as these extra neutrons or extra protons are absorbing the bosons of the weak force and making this happen. Now you really need to understand all of this at the earth space science level and this is just more like a curiosity thing but you do need to know that radioactive decay can be in the form of a particle or in the form of energy which are called gamma ray decay. Now even though not shown here some kinds of, a, of decay can also release protons instead of of uh, electrons. Now sometimes when it does that the atom that comes out of the decay is going to be the kind of like the form because it's missing one of its protons and other times it's going to be actual spherical because it had too many uh, neutrons so losing that one is actually what made it look normal. And that's kind of how actually works with radioactive decay especially small particle decay because of extra neutrons. Now when the atom is too big you're going to have this kind of decay happen as well. For example, uranium is a very, very unstable atom. As you can see in the bottom here, it has 92 protons. And just because it's trying to stay stable, 146 neutrons are going to be necessary to actually try to maintain the stability of this atom. And it's not going to be enough. Now, notice how it actually looks in a natural state. And it actually can, can glow, especially when exposed to certain kinds of ultraviolet radiation. And this is how it looks in a refined state that we actually use in nuclear reactors and things like that. Now, what will happen here is that over time, uranium will actually decay into smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller atoms until you finally get to the end of the decay series where it actually makes a lead atom. Now, notice how sometimes it will undergo alpha decay, other times it will go beta decay, other kinds it will go alpha decay and so forth. And now sometimes it will spend a very, very long time as that piece, but at other times it will spend shorter time, just 24 days. Other times it will spend minutes. Other times it will spend thousands of years. But when all is said and done, it will take millions of years for a uranium-238 to decay until it actually becomes the stable lead. And every single one of the steps in the process, from uranium through things like thorium and pro protactium and uranium again and thorium again and then radon and polonium all of these different versions are going to be radioactive elements and so this is what we call the uranium-238 radioactive decay chain 
And this is going to be important for rock dating. We're going to talk about that in the next video. But you need to understand that it will take a long time for this to happen. Okay? But it's happening because uranium is so large that whenever it gets impacted by a particle, say like a neutron, that's usually enough to make the whole thing deactivate and kind of destabilize and split. And it will usually split into uh, smaller chunks, sometimes half the size, and other neutrons, which then go on to hit other neutron atoms and other actual uh, nuclei, which then undergo the same process, which then make more neutrons, which then create other nuclei, which then undergo the same process, and that repeats itself over and over again, kind of like a chain reaction bowl effect kind of thing. Now, in nature, when this has happened naturally, it will take a very, very long time for this process to actually progress. It will happen very slowly, almost one atom at a time. And then it will take millions of years for all the mass that was originally the uranium-238 to actually decay into a state that's going to be um, stable, like the lead-206. Okay? Now, this is what we call large decay, and it, it's mediated by the same kind of stuff. It's alpha decay and beta decay, but sometimes it actually splits into whole chunks of smaller atoms, and especially doing things like fission reactions. Now, this is actually what's happening here. It's called fission because the nucleus is splitting up as opposed to actually getting bigger, as it happens doing fusion instead of stars. So this is actually the opposite of making higher elements by colliding them at high speeds and high pressure the way it happens inside of stars and particle accelerators. This is the opposite. This is fission that happens as the atom becomes unstable because it's too large for its own good. So to review what we talked about, first of all, of course, a radioactive decay will happen in isotopes of atoms. And I'll study on the right side of this chart over here. Now, isotopes are basically different versions of the same atom which may contain extra neutrons. And the neutrons are in the nucleus of the atom which also contains protons. Now, it will occur naturally in any element which has an atomic number bigger than 83 because it's going to be unstable. And it will also occur in atoms which have extra number of neutrons. And in that case, you're going to eject particles from the nucleus such as electrons doing beta decay. And that right takes us to the types of decay. Now remember that doing radioactive decay, parent elements become daughter elements through either ejection of energy in the form of photons, gamma rays, or an actual nucleus of a helium atom, which is called alpha decay, or beta decay, which is an energetic electron or positron, depending if it's beta negative or beta positive decay. Remember, the beta negative is the one that you transform a neutron into a proton and make an electron and an antineutrino. And beta positive is going to be the one that you, you, you transform a proton into a neutron and make a neutrino and an anti-electron or a positron. Now, using these things of half-life, we can do lots of cool things, including uh, using carbon-14, which is an unstable, uh, small decay or neutron kicking out kind of thing, where the weak interaction will cause this to happen. And we use that to date organic materials, such as dead human remains. But we also use a different kind of more long-term dating, more stable for a very long period of time, like your uranium-238 lecture series, with, uh, reactivity series we talked about, into actually dating inorganic materials such as rocks. All right? Now, this is actually very interesting. Remember, though, by the way, that the whole decay will produce both energy and small particles, including the neutrinos. And by the way, the idea of the neutrino was discovered here to explain the fact that when you account for the matter that's coming out of the nucleus and you account for the electron and for the energy that's coming out, a little bit of mass seems to be missing. And that had to be the neutrino. And for years, there was, this was theorized until we finally found the actual neutrinos and detected their presence uh, using neutrino detectors. And now we actually found out that the same kind of things happen inside of stars doing matter-antimatter collisions. Okay? So that's a review of radioactivity, and on the next video, we're going to be talking about how do we use this reactivity, reactivity in our actual lives.